Ahoy, adventurers! Joe Buddy Hambone here with another coupon code from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This month, the code is Roll Dice, and it is good through September 7th for $6 off orders of $25 or more, either online or in person. Now, you heard me right. It is $6 off orders of $25 or more, either online or in person, using the code Roll Dice. And hey, it's back to school season, so if you're already out there picking up some pencils and papers, why not get yourself a new set of dice or maybe a brand new rpg to kick the fall season off right use the code roll dice and if you're shopping at noble night games already on august the 10th which is the day this episode airs noble night games is doing their free rpg day online event they're kicking it off with a special deal that for every fifteen dollars you spend you can obtain any of the rpg day promo items for only a penny be sure to check out their website for more details on that and don't forget to use the code ROLLDICE to get $6 off an order of $25 or more, either online or in person, now through September 7th, from your friends and mine, Noble Night Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs, with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. We've been talking about doing this episode for so long, I forgot the joke I was going to tell, Stu Horvath. (laughs) Yeah, 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 it's the truth. You know, this is one of the most requested topics I've seen for episodes since we started doing this show, so I figure it's finally about time we talk about riffs. Yeah. Do I sound overwhelmed? You sound whelmed at best. <laughs> That's because Rips is like the most overwhelming game ever. <laughs> it's just so <sighs> big and ever bigger. It starts out big and just keeps growing. It's like, what's a, does Godzilla keep growing? It depends on who's running the show, but you know, <laughs> certain characters like Godzilla, the Incredible Hulk, get bigger, smaller, depending on who is behind the camera. So, Fair enough. You know, we're going to say that this one is definitely a grower and not a shower. <laughs> oh, no, it's both. It's definitely both. It's so showy. Rifts is, of course, the most famous, I think, of the Palladium RPGs. I guess you could argue that the TMNT, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles RPG, is more famous. I don't know. I feel like TMNT and the after the bomb stuff is just an extension of rifts in a lot of ways, even though it predates rifts. But that's sort of the thing about Palladium's stuff is that it was all designed on this house system that developed over time, you know, and it was all initially rooted in D and D through the Palladium fantasy RPG, which is very, very D and D derivative. And then there is, I think it's called the mechanoids. There's a couple books that sort of start introducing new mechanics and all of that sort of, comes to a head in 1990 with the release of Rifts. We're going to get into those other earlier books at a different time. All you need to know is that when Rifts finally comes out, the Megaversal system was already sort of a composite of several other systems and mechanics that had appeared in other games. So you're saying this is the Voltron of RPG systems? We just slapped a bunch of shit together and formed one massive book. Yeah, like it's Voltron all the way down because it's the systems, the way they interact, the narrative of the setting. All of that is about things interlocking and (laughs) becoming bigger. To give you an idea of the system, the system's percentile for skills, but the damage is where it kind of gets crazy. Because like there's regular damage and as things get bigger and bigger, you're dealing with power armor and like crazy energy weapons, but also characters could have a sword or a bow. So all of the damage and stuff has to kind of scale and they keep introducing things that increase the scale. So there's just regular old damage in riffs. And then there's like mega damage. <laughs> it's actually called mega damage. So there's two different kinds of damage. Yeah. So each point of mega damage is equal to like, I don't know, like 100 points of structural damage. There's all these different sorts of damage. I think there's like an even bigger scale of damage, too. It's like ultra mega damage or something silly. That just kind of gives you an idea about how they approach this game. 
it is essentially the teenage version of like who would win in a fight the rpg oh no really yeah, yeah, totally. It's designed in every way to put everything in the same stew pot so you could pit vampires versus Tyrannosaurus Rex and see who wins in a fight. Or like aliens versus Godzilla or the four horsemen of the apocalypse versus Cthulhu. Like all of those things are in the game in some respect and all of those things are statted and you could fight them and have them fight. Well, first off, I just want to point out that Cthulhu doesn't job for anybody. So obviously it's going to be Cthulhu against the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Secondly, I mean, you know, who would win in a fight is a great game when you're like walking out of the movie theater with your buddies and your kid. And sometimes even when you're an adult. But man, not when there's actual math involved. (laughs) That is the thing. That is totally the thing. That's why I don't like riffs all that much, because I feel like the system is just too big. And so the idea is that there's all these riffs in reality and the world has changed. So, like, there's some really great narrative stuff. The first world book is Kingdom of the Vampires in South America and Mexico and stuff. And that book is so good. It's so packed with so many weird ideas. And they actually sat down and thought about it. Whereas later Rift source books were obviously, you know, kind of cranked out with less thought. But every book introduces more. It's, it's this gigantic interlocking modular system. So one of the main things that people think is awesome about Rifts is the power armor, right? And I like power armor. Power armor is a cool idea. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of power armor, but everybody wants the Glitter Boy. Say what now? Yeah, it's called Glitter Boy armor. Glitter Boy, like I am a vampire in twilight glittering in the sunlight. Is it like a Duran Duran album cover? Like, what are we talking like here? I don't know why it's called Glitter Boy. I've never actually looked it up. I've just always sort of accepted it as being called Glitter Boy power armor. Honestly, we're going to preserve the mystery because it's strange and I don't really want to know. I'm good with that answer because I'm here for it. Get me some Glitter Boy armor now. So everybody wants Glitter Boy armor, but every book that comes out, even if it's a low-tech setting, like the source book for Avalon, which is like, you know, England area, like that has new power armor and new vehicles that are always bigger and have more missiles attached to them, you know? And it goes both ways. You have like Arthurian stuff and like the Arthurian stuff is super weird because it's actually like aliens pretending to use magic, but there is actual magic. You can go to Atlantis and Atlantis is this weird trans-dimensional marketplace, which is super cool, but that introduces all these other dimensions and aliens and entities. Like every book that comes out just exponentially builds the world. And as the world keeps expanding the systems that interact in the game to account for all of that stuff increases as well (laughs) and i think that it actually handles it slightly better than torg in a lot of ways both those games riffs and torg have the same problem it's just like everything that gets added no matter how cool the idea there's underlying mechanical issues because it's just rules bloat there's just more always more and that is the other moral of riffs always more (laughs) my God, I hear this. And my first thing is I think of Wreck-It Ralph (laughs) when they turn all of the different arcade cabinets off. And then suddenly like you have like M. Bison hanging out with like Pac-Man hanging out with like Donkey Kong. And then you've got like, you know, the dude from Dragonlance, Wreck-It Ralph and like Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. And it's just like, yeah, this is just, you know, it's like backstage where like (laughs) all our worlds are connected. But like Master Chief is over there getting a scone until they turn the machines back on in the morning. Like, it's very interesting because the other side of my thought is, you know, I think about when you would make, like, say, a DC Comics or a Marvel superheroes thing where there are things that exist from all these worlds in one world. Like, you know, you've got Blade the Vampire Hunter. You've got Devil Dinosaur. You've got Namor. You've also got an actual Morgan Le Fay who exists in this world as well. You've got space aliens and cosmic threats. However, it's all kind of balanced out and easier to balance because in the end of the day, whoever's writing that comic is kind of like, all right, Thanos would punch his way through D-Man. So maybe (laughs) I need to scale this fight a little differently. But when it comes to actually sitting at a table and having that portrayed, I can totally see how all these ends wouldn't butt up together in one easy, breezy beautiful way to be like all right so just roll this dice yeah and you're good who wins in a fight is like the simplest most straightforward intellectual exercise right it totally ignores 
narrative, right? Like, who's going to win in a fight? Is it Batman or Wolverine? And it's like, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, those two characters aren't really going to fight. Even if one of them wins, like, it doesn't matter. Like, what matters is the story that puts them at odds. But Riffs really doesn't care. Riffs mostly is interested in the who is going to win in a fight. And it is sort of the perfect RPG for teenagers in the 90s. Like, there's no RPG or piece of media even like there's some comic books that come close, but I think that rifts really understands like the mentality of the nineties teenager better than anything that I have ever encountered. Nerdy teenager. How many pouches do these guys have on their power suits? None. There's no pouches. It's pouch free. So it's a completely life free experience. You can see their feet, no pouches. Yeah, there's definitely feet. Actually, <laughs> it's good that you bring up the art because I was about to forget it. One of the best things about, Riffs for me is Kevin Long, who does so much of the artwork for the books. He's a fantastic technical artist. His stuff makes all of this nonsense so much more believable. He draws tech like nobody else and makes it look cool and also like conceivable. And he lends weight to the world that Riffs creates, which if you just read it, you would just be like, this is dumb. <laughs> This is ridiculous. You might get a kick out of it in the mystery science theater way, but you wouldn't want to play it. Long's illustrations make you want to play it because you can see how cool that stuff is. And you could probably make like a big budget summer movie like circa 2005 about riffs and it would have been awesome. Oh, yeah, it would totally would have been a plucky teenager trying to woo the heart of the local girl who maybe too far out of his league and suddenly he falls into the rifts and he's got to rescue his like father who was a scientist who opened the portal to these worlds and then the girl gets embroiled in it as well and suddenly they're facing like vampires and dinosaurs and vampire dinosaurs and cowboys and cthulhu pops up but like it's all up to him and everything in power armor everything in power armor like once he gets the power armor it's game on see what i did there Stu? yeah i do yeah i mean and that's the kind of movie that in like 2005 you know they would probably have made like three of them. I mean, they made like, what, three Spy Kid movies? But at least they had a decent plot and it was centered on family all the way through. However, uh, you know, that's exactly what this sounds like. It sounds like, all right, we are out of ideas and remakes. What are we going to do? Well, let's just open a portal to here and a portal to there and then a portal to like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle World. Do we have the licensing for that? <laughs> and we're going to smoosh it all together in one and probably put like... Breck and Meyer in it at that point. <laughs> but that's another thing. As good as Kevin Long's art is, and I love it, and it's like there's so much zip tone going on. Like the art itself, it's not life healthy, but it is still very 90s. So there's all these guys in power armor and there's all these cool vehicles and big robots with missile launchers attached to their shoulders. But everything's got a skull. Like every robot has a skull head. Every shock trooper in their power armor, the helmet is shaped like a skull. Like there's vehicles where the front grill looks like a skull. There's skulls everywhere. I love skulls. Skulls are awesome. I wore a skull ring for years. I've seen it. But it's one of those things where it's just like, how many skulls can you cram into this game just because skulls are cool? <laughs> I mean, when you have the guys whose foundation for this show is built on skulls and books <laughs> saying maybe it's too many skulls, it might be too many skulls. And, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I love Rifts. I love the excess of Rifts. I never want to play Rifts again. I played it, like, once. It was so much. It was so much math. Like, I could never wrap my head around the system. But I love Rifts. I love how stupid it is and how, like, it doesn't care that I think it's stupid. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, this is the unapologetic summer blockbuster of RPGs. Yeah, like there could be a thousand people saying that Rifts is stupid and Rifts is still going to be there being like, yeah, but I got skulls on my power armor. F off. Haters going to hate. Exactly. And like, I love that. And they're still making Rifts stuff. I'm not sure how the company has gone in the Kickstarter era. I do know that basically Rifts is Kevin Sam Bieta. I think I said that right, is the author and artist, which is another thing that makes me like in awe of riffs is that it's like all the work of one man or so much of it is. He directed all of it. And back in the day when Cerebus was getting released and they called them the phone books. Oh, yeah. Like that's the same thing with the riffs books. Each riffs book is at least half an inch thick. And I feel like there's hundreds of them. <laughs> like he just cranked these things out. And there's just so much, so much material. And like, when you crank out that much material, like, you know, a lot of it's going to be bad as, you know, probably in a greater proportion of what's good. And like, I think that 
when you decide to just put it all out there anyway, like to be that unapologetic about it, the end product becomes something that like transcends good and bad. It's like Uwe Boll movies. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes. Like, it's not camp, but it's something. And it's something that you kind of don't want to get involved with, but like you do anyway, and you have a good time, even though it's terrible. Oh, my God. Riffs is a lot. Even just talking about like the idea behind Riffs is a lot. Everything about this game is a lot. Well, Stu, it does sound like a lot. And to answer your thought before, it would be Batman. Batman would have won the fight. Of course, because Batman's always got the contingency plan. Always. It's probably centered around a magnet of some kind. They'd probably do it in a junkyard. I don't know. Now you've got me thinking. Do you have any final thoughts on riffs? My final thought is that once you start thinking in the who would win in the fight mentality, like you start applying it to everything, and you can see how quickly in your personal consumption of culture, how quickly that that spins out of control. And just take that feeling of vertigo and chaos and then apply it to a role-playing game. And I feel like that is the essential experience of just reading a Riffs rule book, not even playing it because playing it's even wilder. There you go, Stu. Folks, this was another awesome episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can the people find you? They can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG, posting daily about stuff like Riffs because somebody's got to do it. And that man is Stu. You can find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker, I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons. You can also find my day-to-day adventures in podcasting and in life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you like like the show, think about stopping by our Patreon, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. We have a ton of of cool extra stuff, including early release episodes, including a private Discord server, and more fun surprises. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 